Have you ever been on the receiving end of a participation trophy? You know that award that is given to everybody on the team is kind of an obligation. It's more to just like placate your parents, right? I always think of those as like a monument to mediocrity or like a, an award that says world's okayest teammate, right? Well, I remember when I first received a participation trophy, trophy I was in uh, elementary school. I was on a little league team and I was hands down the worst player on the team. It's a joke that I even tried. Um, when I got up to the place where the batter goes, that I want to say batter's mound, but that's not right. The place where the batter goes, where they throw the ball, right? When that ball comes hurling at me at tens of miles an hour, I often would be so scared, I'd just run from it. And sometimes in my frantic frenzy, I would run straight into the thing. But I was no better in the outfield. Uh, when they put me in the outfield, it was way in the outfield, like, do less damage, and I'd be the kid out there doing cartwheels and picking flowers. And so when the award ceremony came about at the end of the season, I thought, it's so weird that I'm even invited to this. Like even at this age, I knew I am not athletically gifted. And so we get there, it's at Abby's Pizza, and I'm like, I'm just here for the food. And the coach starts bringing up students and congratulating them on their growth or just saying a kind word about them. And then he calls my name, and I'm like, what is happening? <laughs> I don't deserve an award. Did you see how I played this year? Like you might assume by watching me that I worked for the opposing team. And he hands me this plastic golden statue of a baseball player. And I remember walking back to my seat thinking, I don't deserve this. I didn't earn this. There's no merit in me that deserves this trophy. And you better believe I threw it away as quick as I could. Because I had decided, if I don't earn it, it's not mine. And I'm afraid far too often that mentality can seep into our relationship with God. Where though we may know grace is a free gift, the works mentality can seep in and we can say, I didn't earn this. It must not be for me. And here's what it looks like. We can often believe that the love of God ebbs and flows based on our moral behavior, right? When I'm doing really well and I'm making good choices, God must love me more. And when I'm doing poor choices and, and walking in sin, God must not love me anymore. And so uh, we, can, we can have this view of God that his love is changing depending on how well I perform. The gospel knows nothing about that. We can look at grace much like I looked at that trophy and say, I don't deserve this. I need to prove my way. And so we're going to spend the next nine weeks looking at this idea of grace. And you may say over two months for one word, that's excessive. But let me cast a vision for why. I firmly believe that if we ever want to be mature followers of Jesus who are on mission with God in the world, we have to have had a deep experience with grace, not just an intellectual understanding, but a deep experience of it. And when we have had that experience, then we can be people who are conformed to the image of God by the power of the gospel and living out the gospel on mission in our sphere of influence. Because you don't outgrow grace. You see, some people think grace is where we start and then we move on to deeper things of God. That's not true. We don't outgrow grace. Grace is how we grow. And so we're going to spend nine weeks on this idea of grace. And my hope is that our amazement for the grace of God towards you and I would be rekindled all over again. Today, we're going to uh, be in Luke 15, and I thought it was very interesting. In all of the Gospels, Jesus never defines grace. He doesn't analyze it. He doesn't exposit it. What he does is he displays it in his own life, number one. And number two, he tells stories and parables to explain what it's like, because grace is always played out in relationship. And so we're going to be in Luke 15, and to give us a little bit of context, um, we're going to be... In Luke 15, starting in verse 1, this is the context for where we're going today. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. So here's Jesus. This is a scene. Here's Jesus. He's hanging out with these people of ill repute. 
right? These aren't the up and ups. These are spiritual outsiders. These are the drunkards, the drug addicts, the prostitutes, the adulterers. There's something winsome about Jesus that people are just drawn to him. They want to come to him. They flock to him. He's holy, righteous, and he hates sin. And yet sinners flock to him. And he specifically points out tax collectors here. Now, tax collectors were a hated group of people. They were mostly Jewish people who worked for the Roman government. And they would collect taxes, but they weren't like the IRS. They would, they would take over and above what, they, what was necessary and keep the rest for themselves so that they could live wealthy lives. They were often very well off. And the funds that they took from the people and gave to Rome went to fund the Roman military machine. You see, Rome had a vast empire. And if there's a rebellion on one side of the empire, you don't have drones to strike and quell it in this day. They had to have a massive army of people that could subjugate the citizens. And so that's what these tax collectors were gathering funds for and towards. It amounted to what was state-sponsored terrorism against their own people. And so Jesus is hanging out with all these people. And understandably so, look, the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. They're saying, what? Doesn't he know his story? Doesn't he know them, that, that this woman was where she was last night? Doesn't he know that this man is a liar? Doesn't he know that this man is stealing? And they're looking at the crowd that Jesus hung out with and saying, there's something off here. And they're sitting in judgment on him. And then Jesus, it says, he goes to tell them a parable. He actually tells them three parables. Firstly, the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the lost sheep, and ending with the parable of the prodigal son. And that's where we're going to spend our time today. So Luke 15, starting in verse 11, it said, And he said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. So this dad has got two sons, a younger, older son. The younger son comes to him and says, Dad... I want your money. I, I realize I'm, I'm going to be an heir to your estate when you die. I want it now. Really what he's saying in essence is, Father, I wish you were dead so I could have the money that's coming to me. And so he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. Now it's clear from how the younger son just spoke to the father that he's already made this journey in his heart. And now he leaves physically. When we walk away from God, the journey away from him begins here. Far before we can ever see the evidence of it in our life. When we walk away from God, it begins here. And his father is a picture of God. And the sons are a picture of two responses to God. Two relationships with God. And so he goes away into a far country and there he squandered his property in reckless living. This son lives it up. He's having a great time. He's fulfilling every fleshly desire you can imagine. He would have been the talk of the town. With all of these resources, he could spend lavishly on parties and banquets and feasts. Ladies would have flocked to him. The guys would have, he would, he would have been the envy of the town. And he squanders it all in wild, reckless living. He left the safety of his father's home. He left a loving, caring home to go off and pursue every fleshly desire he could imagine. And look what happens to him. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. The son pursued every appetite he had. And on the other side of it, He's still in need. The fleshly desires will never satisfy. And so he finds himself in need because there's a severe famine. And you'd think maybe this is where he turns back to dad, this gracious father that we see in this story. But it's not. Plan A is not go back to daddy. Plan A is I'm going to try and figure this out on my own. Look at what he says. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country. So when the problem came, he's in need, he spent everything he had. Now he goes and he tries to fix the problem for himself. And he hires himself out. And the person who hired him sent him into his fields to feed pigs. 
And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. No one gave him anything. He, he, he's so hungry. There's such a severe famine that he desires to eat what the pigs are eating. Like, have you seen a pig eat? It's not appetizing. <laughs> but here he is. He's, he's watching these pigs eat these pods. And he's like, man, that looks like a tasty morsel. And so he's starving near to death. And no one gives him anything. And this is where he comes to himself. It says, verse 17, But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I don't think he's being a drama queen. I think this dude is really close to death. This is a severe famine. He has no resources to provide for himself. He's starving to death. And he says, I will arise and go to my father. I will say to him. And he's got this speech that he's going to prepare. But plan A is not working out. It's not providing for his need. And so he's, he remind, he's reminded of his father's house. But I think it's interesting that he's not reminded of meals, sitting down with his father and his brother, family time around a warm dinner. Where does his mind go? How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? I think there's an identity shift that happened in this son. Where he knows because of what he's done, he doesn't deserve right relationship with the father anymore. And so now now he's identified himself with a failure and he's saying, maybe I could come back and be a hired servant. Maybe I can come back and earn my way into my father's good graces by proving it with my work. I will arise and go to my father, verse 18, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. This young son who's squandered all of this property is, I'm sure, terrified for this moment to own up to his sin. And he begins walking back home in his tattered party clothes with no shoes on. And he has nothing to show for all of the wealth that his father gave him. And here's what happens next. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. Now, I don't know if dad is sitting on the front porch with binoculars, a telescope, or just has amazing vision. But this dude has been waiting for his son. And he sees him and he's overwhelmed with compassion. The word here in the original language for compassion talks about this deep-seated feeling Compassion is a, a, the seeing of a need and the desire to meet it. And so the father has this deep-seated compassion for his son that compels him to do what happens next. And he ran and embraced and kissed him. Now put yourself in the son's shoes for a moment. The last time you saw this man, you told him you wished you were de- he was dead and you took a bunch of money from him. And now he's running towards you. Can you imagine? Like if I'm in the son's shoes in this moment, I'm going to think this is going to be a smackdown. He's going to tackle me to the ground and we're going to throw down WWE style, right? He doesn't know what's fueling this running of the father. It's very uncommon for a patriarch in this day. It was considered undignified because if they were to run, it meant they were hurried and unprepared. And when they ran, they, or the patriarchs of the day, they would wear long robes down to the ankle. So he would have to gird up his, his clothing to run towards his son. So this father throws off all dignity, not because he wants to throw down and he's angry, but because the compassion compels him. And he gets to his son, embraces him, and kisses him. But it doesn't stop there. The son begins to explain to his father the transaction that he wants to make to kind of earn his way back into uh, the family or uh, to be a servant. He says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. The son begins his explanation. It's almost as if the father doesn't even hear it. He's saying, Father, I'm sorry. And the father doesn't stop with just a hug and a kiss. His grace continues. He he sees his tattered party clothes and he says, let's give him the best robe we have in the house. Let's put shoes on his feet and let's put a ring on his finger. This is identity language. He's saying, 
You're not just a servant. You're a part of the family. You belong here. This is lavish grace. And it doesn't stop there. He continues. And bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. You see, meals during these days very seldom had meat because meat was an expensive commodity, let alone a fattened calf. This probably was prob- his, his prized possession of his livestock. And when you killed the fattened calf, you would invite the community over to celebrate. This is a rager that this dad is throwing for his son. There's dancing, there's music, there's food, there's celebration of this wayward son who's come back to his dad. And this would be really a a, a fairy tale ending right here if the parable stopped. Right? You see a father who's deeply hurt by his son's actions, comes back, there's forgiveness, there's acceptance, there's lavish grace, ends with a celebration. But this is not where Jesus chooses to end the parable. And goes on. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he, the servant, said to the older brother, him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he's received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. So the servant tells the older brother, Here's what happened. Your brother came back. He's safe. He's sound. They're in there celebrating. And the older brother, in his anger, stays outside. Look what the father does. His father came out and entreated him. That word entreated is like a a tender plea. Come, come join the grace banquet. But he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you and I've never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, notice he won't even acknowledge it's his brother. When this son of yours who has devoured your property with prostitutes, when he came home, you killed the fattened calf for him? You notice the comparison there? He says, look, I've served you. I've obeyed everything you've asked. All of the commands I've followed. I've always done everything you wanted of me. And you never celebrated me. But now that this son of yours, this wayward loser that came home, who squandered everything, you're going to celebrate him? Don't you think he's already taken enough of your stuff? Now you're lavishing more of it on him? Now remember for a moment, the audience who's here. The Pharisees and the scribes are listening into this parable. And I think they're thinking, finally, somebody with some sense. Like this older father, this father has lost his mind lavishing grace on this son. This son needs to repay. Finally, this older brother makes some sense. Like, let's get to the bottom of this. Let's, let's make this son pay for what he's done. And he, the father, said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, For this, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. You see, not one time in this story do we hear the word grace, but it's chock full of it. And so I want to kind of analyze a few responses to grace that we see in this story. And from there, see how we can learn in our understanding and our experience of grace. The first thing I want us to notice is people are naturally religious. We're naturally religious. Let's look at it in the two sons. Firstly, the younger son, he prepares a speech for his father. He's got this transaction in the works. And here's what he says. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. I was reading a commentary on this and one of the scholars said, That the plan was that he was going to learn a trade to pay his father back for what he took. Because property owners had servants who were regular servants of the property, the livestock, the home. And then they had hired servants who would take a specific skill set. And he's saying, 
Allow me to learn a specific skill set that I might repay you for the wrong I've done. You see, he didn't understand grace. He believed, rightly so, he knew he had done wrong, but he thought he's going to have to curry favor. He's going to have to earn his way. He's going to have to try really hard. That's religion. Religion is focused on my efforts to earn God's favor. Grace is focused on Jesus' efforts on my behalf to freely give favor. And so he's got this plan, but it's not just him. The older brother, when the father comes out to him, he answers his father with this. Look, these many years I've served you and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. You see, the older brother thought this was a transactional thing as well. Religion is always transactional. It's if I do this or don't do this, this happens with God. That's not God's love. God's love is unchanging towards you. But like I said earlier, we tend to think it ebbs and flows based on my behavior and my performance. That's not the gospel. The gospel is the good news of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That Jesus lived the life that you and I could never live. Not only was he sinless and and never gave in to temptation, not only did he stand up to Satan himself, but he walked in obedience to the Father every day. For all, the entirety of his life on this earth, he, he walked in obedience to the Father perfectly. And then in his death, he died the death that we deserve. He died the death that you and I deserve. That on the cross, Jesus took our sin upon himself. Your sin, my sin, went on Jesus, the sinless one. And the wrath of God, the holy, righteous, just wrath of God was poured out on Jesus in our place. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. The only transaction the gospel knows about is that when we place our trust in Jesus, he takes our sin and we get his righteousness. But he didn't stay dead. You see, Jesus didn't stay dead. He's powerful. He's God in the flesh. And so three days later, he rose from the grave, triumphing over death, triumphing over sin, triumphing over Satan and his legions, triumphing over the enemy. And he made a public display of his victory for all to see. That's the gospel. And when we place our trust there and in there alone, We can find grace for our sin. But grace is far more than just forgiveness of sin. It's an identity. It's a place to live from. You get gifts inside of grace. It's an unending package. And I'm afraid far too often, it's easy for us to look at grace as a get out of hell free card. But grace is so much more than that. And we're hoping to unpack some of that with you as we walk through this series. But we're naturally religious. And religion can seep into our relationship with God. Where instead of focusing on Jesus earning uh, our, our position with God, we can think, oh, I need to try harder to earn it. That is a lie. So we're naturally religious. But God is naturally gracious. If you were to ask yourself the question, what flows out of the heart of God most freely? It's grace. Let's look at it in the story again. While he was still a long way off, the father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. The son begins this conversation He begins to try to justify himself, but there's no trepidation in the father. There's no hesitation. There's no walking up to the son and saying, you're going to now have to prove to me that you're worthy of my presence, that you're worthy of coming back. The father just runs after him. And what flows from his heart is this compassionate grace. And it continues. Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. 
You see, the father forgives him. That's a picture of salvation. But he clothes him. That's a picture of your identity. If you're in Christ, you are not your failures or your successes. Don't live on the crazy train of that. If you're in Christ, your identity comes from Christ. And we're going to unpack that here in a couple of weeks. But the, the father, he, he forgives him of his sin. He clothes him in the family's best. And then there's a huge celebration that takes place. Let us eat and celebrate. Lavish, lavish grace that is thrown on this wayward child. God is naturally a gracious God. Do you believe that? I don't, I don't know about you, but for me, at times that's hard to believe. When I've failed or when I've been uh, impatient with my children or frustrated at home, it, it's easy for me to look at my failure and say, well, God doesn't really love me right now. Or God's grace doesn't extend this far. That's not true. And that's not to say that God is not also a wrathful, holy, righteous God. He is. We don't excuse other attributes so that others can take the spotlight. But if you were to ask yourself what flows most freely from God, it's grace. I think of when Jesus comes into Jerusalem and he's weeping. He's weeping over the city. Why? Because they've rejected him. And he said, how long have I desired to gather you together? He's weeping over them. But not just because of their rejection, but because he knows because of their rejection, judgment is coming. The same God who will judge the sinner is the one who desires that the sinner would be a recipient of his grace. I remember when I uh, really experienced this in a relationship. Um, in my teen years, I was addicted to opiates and um, I, there was a time where I ran out of money for this expensive habit. And I, uh, my grandfather was still alive at the time and, and he um, had Alzheimer's. And so I knew if I went over to his house and took money from him, he would forget. And so I went over to his house and I stole some money out of his kitchen and left and he forgot just like I anticipated. And I went and used the money. And that haunted me for years. There's this shame about that choice. Even in the moment, I knew it was wrong. And about five years ago, I was heavily convicted by God that I, need, I needed to start bringing some of the darkness to light in that area. And so I, uh, I, I planned a speech. I, I heavily identify with the prodigal in this moment. I planned a speech to share with my mom what I had done. And I remember I was afraid to see her face to face. And so I called her in the Starbucks parking lot. And I wasn't afraid because anything in her, it's just, I knew I had done wrong. And so I called her up and I, and I explained that I had stolen from grandpa all those years ago. And I was so sorry. And she said, Jason, I've always known that you did. And I'm so glad you came and told me. And I forgive you. And in that moment, it was like, I, I knew I didn't deserve this. I didn't earn this. And, but freely, I was given grace. Freely, I was given forgiveness. That's a picture of our God. What's God's response to a wayward, disobedient son or daughter when they come back to him? Every time it looks like this. Now, that doesn't mean there's not natural consequences of sin. There is. And it grieves God's heart when we go and walk in disobedience. But when we repent and we come back to him, we find grace upon grace. And so Jesus is telling this parable and think about the crowd that's there again. He's got these tax collectors and people of ill repute, the, the spiritual outsiders. And then he's got the Pharisees and the scribes, the spiritual insiders. And I think as Jesus is telling this picture of this father who deeply loves his son so much, even though the son has gone wayward, I think they're, they're thinking, maybe there is hope for me. I've been told my whole life there's no hope for the sinner, that I could never make it to God, that I have to follow all these rules. But if God is like this father, maybe there's hope for me. And I think the Pharisees and the scribes 
listened to that same story and thought, this father is wayward and reckless himself. Why would he forgive a wicked sinner like the younger son? It's ridiculous. That's not what God's like. And Jesus ends this parable in a very interesting way to me. And I think the reason why is he's trying to make the point that grace is still available. Grace is still available. Let's look at it in the passage. But he was angry. This is the older, older brother. He refused to go in and his father came out and entreated him. Now remember, the Pharisees are listening in and I think they identify with this older brother. You know what's interesting? The Pharisees are judging Jesus for eating with sinners and tax collectors just like the older brother is judging the father for eating and celebrating with this wayward sinful son. I think this is a picture of the Pharisees and the scribes. And Jesus does not have a glowing recommendation of the Pharisees. He's got some harsh words to say for them. He calls them hypocrites and vipers. And if you read Matthew 23, uh, it, it's, it's a brutal uh, if you're a Pharisee. But this father, I believe, is, is pursuing his son and saying there's grace that's still available. He said to him, son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. He said, look, you talked about everything you did for me, but you've forgotten the most important part, that you're with me. This is relationship. And all that I have is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. Because your brother, who is dead, he's come back safe and sound. He's alive again. And I think Jesus is saying these words with this audience in mind. And you notice, we don't know what the older brother's response is. We don't know if he repents and comes inside and joins the grace banquet. Or if he stays outside in judgment. And I think Jesus does that on purpose. Because he's throwing a question to the Pharisees. Will you join me? Will you become a part of what God is doing here? Will you, will you come to the grace banquet? So the question I want us to wrestle with today is, which of these two brothers are you most like? In this season, are you more like the wayward brother, the prodigal, living in disobedience and maybe afraid to come back to God? The father says, come home. And maybe you are the older brother. Or you're looking to your morality, your behavior changes as your source of identity and worth before God. The father says, come home. Come be a part of this banquet with me. Thank you so much for joining us. Jesus loves you. So do I. Have a great day. Thank you guys so much for sticking around and, and joining us as we learn about grace. And the challenge we want to leave you with today is in this story of the prodigal son, which brother are you most like? Which one do you identify with? It reveals something of our understanding of grace when we can say, yep, I get, I'm, I'm more like the older brother and I think I need to earn my way or I'm more like the younger son and I think there's no way for me back to God. So which one do you identify with more? And then the next thing we want to challenge us to is to continue to live on mission. Um, we've been going through the blessed strategy for a, a couple months now. And um, I wanted to just lay out for us what each letter meant. So beginning in prayer, we've talked about that. It means starting every day with God. Let, help me to join you in what you're doing in the world. The listen and engage is listening to people's stories and responding accordingly. And then eat. We saw that in our story today. Jesus is eating with the sinners and tax collectors. He's getting to know them. This is a relational environment. And so that's what we're going to challenge us to this week. That, that we would uh, invite people into our homes. I know that can be scary. But invite people into, into your home. Your neighbors. Your friends from work. Whatever. And just get to know them. Build relationship. Relationship can be a bridge for the gospel. And so we want to challenge our church to, in the next couple of weeks, have a couple families over and invite them into your sphere. Invite them into your world. And then the last two are serve and share. And serve is 
uh, serving those that are around you, that God has placed around you. That could be your neighborhood. It could be somebody you work with or somebody you go to school with. And here's the trick. Be okay if they want to serve you as well. Relationship is give and take. It's not selfish to allow authentic relationship to take place. And lastly, share. As the time arises, as God prompts you, as, as you have the opportunity, share your story, share your testimony, share the gospel. Thanks again so much for joining us. I hope you'll be here next week.